Welcome to Dodgers Dogs. As part of the Dodgers Daily Network, Casey Porter here. Hey, it's been a minute or two. Been to Tulsa and Oklahoma City on back-to-back nights. Want to thank Austin for that wonderful video on the farm system for the Dodgers as far as how they've been. And that's a lot of research he did. And that was just a wonderful video, a lot of great information to take in. And, and so I really enjoyed watching that. And that came actually from his Monday night show. So that was just a wonderful hot take yesterday. So a great show there. And hey, I'll tell you what, not quite sure we'll see what happens when I get to the end of this. I've got a lot to talk about. Haven't, haven't talked to you in a couple of days. Yeah, there's been a lot going on as far as the L.A. Dodgers go. Got a chance to talk to Alan Trejo last night, Trey Sweeney. Going back tonight to talk to Diego Cartaya. Tuesday night went to Tulsa. Got to talk to Chris Campos. Got to talk also to Logan Boyer and Lucas Wepp. Also, Gus Farland got recalled. I got to see him last night, though. He's back down. Ricky Venasco is back up with the big club. club Justin Robo. Uh, Justin Robleski. Robo made his debut on Sunday. Landon Knack is holding his own at the Major League level. Kyle Hurt is likely going to start throwing baseballs here. At least we're optimistic. I'm optimistic from the information I have that he's going to start throwing baseballs again here in about two weeks. Now, that's obviously not pitching, making pitches in games. That's just throwing baseballs. And then also Gavin Stone, who last night gave up uh, four runs to the the Philadelphia Phillies had the outing last night. But, hey, he has uh, been in the all-star conversation this year as far as being a pitcher for the Dodgers. So, hey, I know it's struggle, but we've said it many different times. I am not going to sugarcoat this show. I am not going to sunshine pump, not whatsoever. I think you guys also know and gals out there. I'm also not going to throw shade. But there's a lot of tough conversations to be had. There's a lot of stuff to talk about. So to be honest with you, I'm just going to kind of see how this show goes. And if I have time at the end, I'll put the down on the farm on it. If not, I'm going to make it a separate video so you guys can sift through both and and watch them at your convenience because I have a lot of live video of River Ryan pitching last night. Got to see Dreaming Rosario. Got to see Michael Hobbs in person. Got to see Jake Polarski. All that kind of stuff. So... Got a lot of down the farm video. Definitely going to put a down the farm video out. And I'm not sure if I'm going to tag it the back of this. We'll see at the end. So let's get into the Dodgers talk. Let's talk about what's going on. Now, obviously, the Dodgers, they have a great record. I believe 17 games above 500 still. And still, believe it or not, with all of this really average to sometimes poor play by the Dodgers that we've seen, still have a seven and a half game lead. That is significant. Now, I know you're going to say, hey, the Dodgers always win the NL West, all that. And you are a thousand percent correct with that take. But it is still a big deal because the Dodgers have so many moving parts right now. Having a seven and a half game lead allows them to manage all those moving parts easier than if, let's say, they were they were losing in the NL West standings or maybe even threatening not to be a part of the wild card and all of that. So... Is winning the NL West a big deal? Always it is. First of all, just winning anything's big, especially your division. But I get it if you want to have the, like I said, the, the mentality that that doesn't matter because we've done that before and it didn't help in the playoffs. And it's playoffs or bust. I've talked about this before. Because the Dodgers have come up so short in the playoffs, it's kind of getting tougher to enjoy being 17 games above 500. And having a seven and a half game lead is because, at least for me, everything's like, oh my gosh, well, this, I wouldn't want the team to look like this going into, that's all you can think going into the playoffs. That's the only thing, at least I can think about, instead of just taking it day by day, living in the moment, and enjoying what actually has been a good season at this point, although last month and a half has been very, very average. So, all of those things have happened to me as far as the player personnel. Dodgers are still seven and a half games ahead of the Padres in the NL West. Still have a 17-game over 500 record. And then also, all of this, let's say poor play, just kind of interesting, like, wow, this just doesn't look good, just not a good look. All of this is happening right in front of the trade deadline. That's perfect, guys. I mean, hey, the and gals, the Dodgers went out and got Shohei Otani. 
A couple years ago, they signed Mookie Betts and Freddie Freeman and and Yoshinobu Yamamoto. And they just re-signed Will Smith. They signed all their legacy guys like Chris Taylor, Kike Hernandez, because they were all in. So when you look at the way this roster was constructed, it was constructed not to just win one World Series. It was constructed to win multiple World Series. I just can't imagine any scenario to where the Dodgers don't fix the problems they have. They're obvious. Can you rely on Yoshinobu Yamamoto to come back? Well, let me ask you this question. The Dodgers love using veterans over their prospects because it gives them a past history to draw upon, which in their minds gives them a floor, which I think is it's very flawed thinking because if you look at Chris Taylor and Kike Hernandez, you keep those guys because you feel like veterans give you a higher floor than prospects. Not in that case. Uh, they have not given you a higher floor whatsoever than, than, than like an Andy Pajes or somebody like that. So uh, this is a, a roster that I just cannot imagine the Dodgers not going all the way in like they did and then coming up short here at the trade deadline. So the first move, let's start here. Max Muncy, uh, the oblique injuries, whether it be pitching, but especially for an offensive player, and especially a guy like Max Muncy that is so violent with his swing. Just go back and look at Max Muncy's swing. It's violent. An oblique injury for Max Muncy is going to be insanely difficult to overcome. I've been saying that ever since it happened. We have experience with this in our own organization. It happened to Cody Hosey in 2021. And I'm telling you, he tried to come back from it. It derailed the entire 2021. It really, I mean, he had a great 2019, Hosey did, after getting drafted, being a first-round draft pick. Got off to a great start. Then COVID hit. And then he had the oblique in 2021. And it's just now. Of course, he's had other injuries, too, that have kind of made him stop and start. But it's just now, 2024, when Cody Hosey is finally on track. Now, like I said, there's other uh, – situations that have led to that as well but as a Dodgers front office guy there is no possible way that you can view the Max Muncy situation in any other way other than we are not going to have him for the rest of the year because those oblique injuries are even if they do get him back even if Max Muncy does come back A, is he going to be 100%? Because I'm telling you, that oblique affects you. And B, even if he is 100%, he hasn't taken a swing in how long? And then when's he going to come back? I mean, how long is he going to have to get back in the groove before the playoffs start? So I think as a front office, as the front office views all of this and the trade deadline, it has to be viewed that Max Muncy is out and out for the rest of the year. If he comes back, great. So, in my opinion, that is the very first position that has to get fixed. Chris Taylor, fine as a stopgap. Kike Hernandez, who made a really nice play, by the way, on that, that give the Phillies credit, putting the ball in play with two strikes with a runner on third and less than two outs, score a run. Kike came in and made a, made a really nice play on that ball. Fine as a stopgap. Kevin Biggio, we've had that conversation. The Dodgers need to figure out that. I don't know what the solution is. I say that. One of my big requests was whenever I was a head coach was, hey, we all have Complaints. I get it. I see all the things that are going wrong just like you do. My request to you is, if you have a complaint, don't bring it to me unless you also have a solution. So I guess I'm kind of speaking out both sides of my mouth because I don't think there is a good solution out there on the trade market. I think if there was one, they would have found it. I think they were just really hoping that Muncy was going to be back. So I say that third base situation, got to fix it. And I bring no solution to the table. So that's kind of the dilemma you're in. I mean, that's very, 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 it's uh, depressing is the wrong word, but it just kind of is worrisome. It's, it, it bothers you. So that also makes me, that also really makes you want to root for a guy like Gavin Lux, 
because if Max Muncie doesn't make it back and Luck starts hitting the ball, let's say Luck starts in the last month or whatever, hits 250, he starts getting on base at a 325, 330 clip, something he's totally – and just becomes decent as an offensive player. Now you move Miguel Rojas to third. Mookie bets when he comes back and be your shortstop. And then Gavin Lux plays second base. Is that perfect? By far, no. But honestly, with what's out there at the trade market, that might actually be your best scenario if you don't get Max Muncy back. I know you could argue with that, but what would your solution be? I mean, I think the Boba Shet thing, I mean, okay. First of all, is that pie in the sky? And second of all, I mean, what kind of year is he having and all kind of and all of that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of moving parts there, just some things to think about. But third base has to get fixed first, in my opinion. Okay, so Yoshinobu Yamamoto. I mean, the thing about this is Tyler Glass now, you could have expected him to need some rest like he's having this year. Some of this chaos that the Dodgers are, are, are feeling is 1,000% self-inflicted. A guy like Tyler Glass now, it should be expected that with the workload he's had, he's going to get shut down at some point. I don't think anybody is surprised by that. Yoshinobu Yamamoto, a guy who's thrown so many innings over the years. So you sign him to the biggest contract ever. You put him under all this pressure. You send him to Korea. You bring him back. You, he's under this microscope. It is absolutely not a surprise whatsoever that with the amount of pressure and stress he's been under, that his body has faltered a touch, especially after all the innings he's thrown in his career. He's just 25 years old. None of that is a surprise. Nobody should have been surprised whatsoever that Yamamoto broke down a touch there. Now, will he be back? I think he will. I can't guarantee you that. I know Austin Brubaker on our last show mentioned that it's not a good idea to rely on that situation. The biggest issue you have with Yamamoto is that he's even when he if he comes back fully healthy, he's not going to do it till like probably at least a month after the trade deadline. Or, a, or a, no, not a month. Let me back up on that. He's not going to do it definitely until after the trade deadline is over. So you're going to have to be making a decision on the Yamamoto deal as far as what types of trades you feel like you need based on a situation that isn't completed yet you don't have the final you don't have the final conclusion as far as what's going to happen with him by the time you do it so there is no doubt about it the dodgers have to go get garrett crochet go get him yesterday now i will say this at tulsa on tuesday i sat with a scout in the pro side for the tigers and I've been to Oklahoma City and Tulsa many different times, and I sit in the same seats as the scouts do. Talk to many of the different scouts, the cross-checkers, the pro-side scouts, the uh, you know, and all those guys. I can honestly say I've never seen a Tiger representative ever at a Drillers game, an Oklahoma City game. That's not to say they haven't been there. That's to say I've never talked to one. I found that interesting. I did mention Tark Scooball to him. Of course, he, he skirted around the issue and was like, yeah, that's the big guy that everybody wants. And he was there to see all the Dodgers players, going to go see the Oklahoma City players. That's another advantage you have of, of having both your AA and AAA in the same state, 100 miles apart, is a guy from the Detroit Tigers can go see all the AA guys. He can go see Alex Freeman, Edgardo Henriquez, Dalton Rushing, and all these guys. Then the next day, he can flip over to Oklahoma City and go watch Trey Sweeney. He can go watch Diego Cartaya. He can go watch all the AAA guys as well. And so it makes it easier for somebody like that to put a package together they would accept for a Targ Scooball. So we'll see how that goes. But the White Sox are, in my opinion, the most, the, the most likely team to want to deal. And again, they can ask for the moon. Doesn't mean they're going to get it. And the last thing they want is to become empty-handed. And, hey, empty-handed is two different ways. If you have a superstar and you're a terrible team, that's empty-handed. You're not winning nothing. You might as well get something back that's going to build your future. So there's empty in two ways. Empty is you remain a really not good team for the foreseeable future and waste this career of Garrett Crochet. Or... 
you can be empty twice, do that, and then also lose him and get nothing in return. And his value is probably never going to be higher. And not necessarily just because he's great, which he has been this year, but also because of the teams that are targeting him. The Dodgers likely, I mean, you look at the pitching next year, of course, best late plans, I get it. You know, but Shohei Otani's coming back. Dustin May will probably come back. Maybe Tony Gonsal and Roki Sasaki might be in the mix. Yamamoto will be back. Glass will be back. Miller, Sheehan will be back. All these guys. Okay, Kyle Hurt will be back. You still have Landon Knack. You still have Gavin Stone. There's going to be all these guys next year in the mix for the Dodgers. So there may never be another position to where the Dodgers or another organization like the Dodgers that have as many prospects to give away are in a position that are as desperate as the Dodgers are right now. So because of that fact, Garrett Crochet will never be more valuable than he is right now. Go get that guy yesterday. Put him on your roster. Make him your number one until Glassnow gets back. Make him his number t- your number two when Glassnow does get back. And then whoever wants to be the number two, number three between him and Yoshinobu Yamamoto. When Yamamoto gets back, Garrett Crochet is an absolute must. That's the obvious one. I do have a solution for that one. I'm not worried about the bullpen. The bullpen is fine. Go get Garrett Crochet and then wait out Yamamoto. Let Glass now get back healthy. And hey, those are your three starters in the playoffs that are all three studs there. And then a, a four starter like a Gavin Stone, not a bad deal. I, I think you can live with that situation. So I think Crochet is is the is the immediate. And then beyond that, I think you can wait out the pitching. Use all of the the whatever prospect capital you want to use from there to try and figure out how to go get another infielder. I mean, I don't know who it – again, I don't have a solution. I don't know who it would be, but that's kind of where I'm at. I'm very optimistic. I'm in a great mood because of all of the wonderful things I've got to do as of late, but I am very aware of all of the far-reaching and not going away – issues that the Dodgers have right now that could and probably would cost them a World Series this year. And (laughs) let's not do that. Let's go figure it out. And hey, who am I to say the front office is fantastic at this? And I I just can't see any snare, like I said earlier, that they won't. So let's talk a little bit about last night's game. Just single runs in three different innings. Like I said, something has just been off. Of course, that something is likely that the entire left side of your infield is out. I mean, when you lose Mookie Betts and Max Muncy, Max Muncy, one of the best run producers in the game, Mookie Betts, one of the best players in the game, even the Dodgers can't overcome that. We're seeing that, and, and we're seeing the effects of that. It's not lackluster. It's literally a lack of roster. It's not lackluster, it's lack of roster. I mean, it, even like I said, even the Dodgers can't lose players that are that good. The Dodgers threatened in the first after Otani led off with a single. He stole second base, but then he had the strikeout by Andy Pius, who, by the way, had two hits last night and had a good game. But again, just empty innings, man. I mean, he had four different innings, four different innings, including the ninth inning, where, I mean, there was no pressure on the defense. The second, the third, the sixth, and the ninth, all were three up, three downs. And so I've talked many different times, the way that you really wear down another team is just to continually put pressure on them, continually put pressure on them. The Dodgers put a little pressure on them in the first with the Otani deal. They put a little pressure on them when Chris Taylor let off with the double. But beyond that, way too easy of innings for the Dodgers. And so the offense, quite frankly, it's not the style of offense uh, that I enjoy watching. It's not enough pressure on the defense. It's frustrating. It, it makes you uh, border. It, but again, it's baseball. There are, I'm telling you, I can't tell you how many times I turned to Eddie and went, hey, man, are we ever going to score again? And he's like, oh, yeah, we'll score again. It might be next week sometime, but we'll score again. I promise you that. So uh, some of this is, hey, it's just baseball. It's 162. It's a long series. You've had a grueling 
schedule and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, blah, blah, blah. I understand if you want to say blah, blah, blah to that. I'm not going to argue with you on that. These guys are high paid major leaguers, but they are humans. But having said that, you know, it's frustrating to watch. I'm not going to lie about that. So Gavin Stone, let's talk about him. Interesting part of his outing, four and two-thirds innings. He gave up nine hits, four runs, three strikeouts, no walks. What he did a lot last night, he doubled up on pitches, which was very interesting. And the thing about a hitter like Kyle Swarber or any of the hitters in the Phillies lineup that are just fantastic hitters, if you double up on pitches, let's like like if you double up on changeups, like you did to Kyle Schwarber. So Schwarber gets to see a changeup, then he gets to see a second changeup. That puts so much pressure on that second changeup or whatever second pitch you're doubling up on, because if they've seen that already, the pitch before, and that pitch isn't perfect, it's going to get hammered. And that's exactly what we saw with Kyle Schwarber, and it was kind of interesting. It set up exactly like their Justin Roblo home run to Christian Yelich over the on Sunday, where instead of throwing that two seam that turned back in on the hands to Yelich, he ran that slider back over the plate, and Yelich hit it for a home run. Well, Gavin Stone throws the change up, and one thing the hitters always tell themselves especially with guys that have really good change-ups like Gavin Stone. You got to see it up. You got to see it up. You got to see it up. Well, Gavin Stone doubled up on change-ups. He left it up. Kyle Swarber saw it up. And ever, whenever you double up and leave the second one up in the zone, even though it did have a good amount of tail to it and Swarber had to go with the pitch, it doesn't matter. He is going to tattoo that pitch in this scenario uh, for a home run. And so – I found that to be very interesting uh, sequences. He this is that was just the first time in many different times to where he either doubled up on pitches, he doubled up on a slider a couple of different times, or he would like throw like slider change up slider and throw the same pitch twice out of three pitches thrown and got hurt as a result of it. So let's get into some so, some more of the examples of how Gavin Stone kind of doubled up, the way he sequenced, and the way that it forced him to. How some of it, I think, was sequencing. Some of it was execution. So I think the home run to Schwarber, I think that was a, a little bit of sequencing, the back-to-back -back change -ups, a lot of execution. He left the ball up. And then whenever you look at what he did to Marsh, I like the fact that he threw his curveball. He stole a strike with his curveball. That's perfect. So the sequencing is great. You're pitching backwards. So you got one part of it perfect. And then the execution wasn't great on the next pitch. I mean, he, he, he gave it back. Whenever you, you pitch backwards and you lead off with a strike and, and you steal a strike with your curveball, then you center cut a fastball. He center cut a four-seam fastball to Marsh. So that one was all execution. The Schwarber home run, I think a little sequencing plus a little execution. I think the base hit by Marsh was all execution as far as pitching backwards and then, and then just throwing a center cut four seam fastball so then kind of like we talked about with kyle swarber he moved that sinker in on the hands of sosa i love that i mean i thought that was great got in on the hands got ahead in the count the sequencing was good and then doubled up again on change-ups and just like he did to kyle swarber he center cut the last two change-ups gave up a hit and then give marsh credit with what we talked about earlier putting that ball in play with two strikes and scoring the run. And so I think that the back-to-back, -back, there, there's more kind of what I talked about at the top of this. Whenever you double up on pitches, even your changeup that's as good as Gavin Stone's, that second one you throw has to be perfect. And we've seen him already mention a couple of sequences where they weren't. Uh, the Schwarber home run and then and then this hit here to Sosa that we're talking about. That weren't, and you give up hits. Okay, so fourth inning, center cut ambush. I don't have any problem with this. He throws a sinker to start the inning off. You go to professional games, first pitch of every inning is right down the middle. He tried to put a little movement to it with his sinker and just got ambushed uh, as far as the, the first pitch. 
of the inning, giving up a base hit. So I have no problem with the execution, no problem with the pitch calling there. And then he doubled up again, at least kind of. This was what I was talking about to Castellanos. He, he would not necessarily double up, but he'd like throw the same pitch uh, twice out of three in a sequence. He threw a sinker in between two sliders. So he threw a slider, sinker, slider. And then on that second slider, Castellanos had seen it just a minute ago. And he got a base hit. To Marshy threw a changeup cutter curve, and then he got him out. So there is kind of a, a scenario there to where when he dub, wasn't doubling up pitches and he was making the other hitter see a fresh new pitch every different pitch, they weren't hitting him. They didn't hit him. At that point, it's all about Gavin Stone executing, and the execution's a little bit easier because the, the hitter hasn't seen that pitch. So even if your pitch isn't perfect, they're less likely to hit it. And then Merrifield, the triple in the fifth, was back-to-back -back sinkers again. So more doubling up on the same pitch, this time uh, the sinker. And then you look at a, a later sequence in the game where Gavin Stone threw a slider, sinker, slider, where he did that two out of three sequence again. So I think all in all, base, uh, the, the bottom line of Gavin Stone's outing last night where he got in trouble was on double up and then forcing that execution on that double up to be perfect something of which he was not last night so I think it was a little bit of, of sequencing that that caused uh, some stress on the execution that that led to the runs that Gavin Stone gave up the great part about that is all of that is so easily fixable and hey i easily could be wrong on all of it that's just all my opinion just one guy's take on seeing the game last night so take it for what it's worth everything i just said in the last five minutes could be 100 percent incorrect who knows i mean i know i know as far as the pitches they threw the pitches that i'm saying that he threw were those but as far as my theories and all that who knows that's just one man's theory okay bobby miller Triple A gets sent down. Let's talk about him. Let's have a tough conversation about him. To be honest with you, Triple A is exactly where he needs to be. Go lack it. Look. Go lack it. Look. Go look at his last four outings in the minor leagues. So here they are, actually. Okay. So in Rancho, he gave up four runs in three and thirds innings, then two runs in four innings at Oklahoma City, five runs in four and two thirds innings at Oklahoma City, and then his first outing with Rancho, he gave up. Three, inning, uh, three runs in three innings. He wasn't ready. I mean, if you want to be frustrated with anybody in this situation, be frustrated with whoever made the decision to rush him up to the major leagues. But the problem with that is, you know, it's not who made that decision, it's what made that decision. Walker Buehler not being healthy, Clayton Kershaw having setbacks, Tyler Glass now, you knew you were going to have to load manage him. Yoshinobi Yamamoto getting hurt. Kyle Hurt. I mean, there's – I don't think it was who made that decision. I think they had to, to, to fast play Bobby Miller because of the situation they were in. So, it's an interesting conundrum. And while I was in Tulsa on Tuesday – had a chance to actually catch up with Jamie Wright. Jamie Wright's a year older than I am. He grew up in the Oklahoma City area at Westmore. Westmore was part of the 6A Oklahoma State Secondary Schools Activities Association. So when I was a junior, he was a senior, knew all about him. He, I'm sure he didn't know. I'm sure he didn't know me in high school, but he knows me now. We, whenever I see him, we talk and we have a good five minute conversation. I ask him about his parents who now, uh, they don't live in Oklahoma City anymore. And, and we have that kind of deal. So he's actually roaming around and working with the top pitching prospects in the organization. So I'm sure he'll be in Oklahoma City working with Bobby Miller, talking about Jamie Wright. Rob Hill's going to be there. So Bobby Miller is in good hands. So it's an interesting conundrum, in my opinion. I think there's two ways this can go. One is you can say, okay, Bobby Miller's execution is not good enough right now combined with his explosiveness to put hitters away. So there's two ways to go at this. We either keep working mechanics to make him as explosive as he needs to be again to be the four seam change up slider occasional steal strike with a curveball power pitcher to get swing and miss that he's not right now or you can say hey he's not that pitcher right now so for the time being let's work around it let's make him a cutter sinker pitcher and let's get a lot of weak contact early in counts so he doesn't have to execute command late in counts and be on the verge of walking guys and 
instead of having to put hitters away late in counts, you're getting early outs and weak contacts and ground balls and lazy fly balls being a sinker cutter pitcher. So do you want to work around where he's at right now? Or do you want to attack where he's at right now and just try to make him become what you think he should be instead of what he is right now? I think those are the two choices that the Dodgers have. And again, I think with Rob Hill, with Jamie Wright, with all of just the unbelievable minds in this organization, they're in good hands. I'll be just absolutely fascinated looking at the the type of sequencing he uses to see which way they go with Bobby Miller. I, I have no idea. I, I, I don't know. But just keep tuning in keep track of it we'll see we'll see if they try to work around where he's at right now and work to, to weak contact make him a sinker cutter type guy try to not necessarily miss bats but miss barrels so he doesn't have to execute and have quite as good a command he can use movement instead of command or if they again want to try to get him back to being the power pitcher that he's capable of of being so uh, i'm going to be inter- real interested in seeing that but i do think the dodgers although they're however many games over 500 i think i said 17 don't quote me on that didn't even look at the record uh, this morning i do know they were seven and a half games uh, in front of the nl west although that is the case i do think there's a lot of things going on in dodger land right now so that's my talk on the los angeles dodgers so that is 32 minutes that's going to be my show for the los angeles dodgers i'm going to make a separate down on the farm shows if you want to watch all the action river ryan jermaine rosario all live live footage from the stadium right behind home plate of river ryan trey sweeney um alan alan trejo by the way had a chance to talk to him interview him all of that coming on down the farm that will be a separate video so hey hope you check that one out so until next time i want to thank you for tuning in and say go dodgers